and having me here to share our experience with neurology workflow at our center. Um, so as you mentioned, you know, I'm an epileptologist and I would like to say mostly an inpatient epileptologist if that's a subspecialty, uh, because mostly I oversee ICU EEG monitoring and uh, very involved with management of seizures and status epilepticus in the hospital. So what I'm gonna share today is mostly neurology workflow pertinent to, to that and our unique challenges. Um, so I don't have any disclosures relevant to this talk. Um, so we already talked a little bit about EEG monitoring in the COVID era. And I think it's an era because COVID is here to stay and we are going to continue to experience the challenges that it has brought over a period of time, uh, although hopefully to a lesser extent in future. So we're seeing that with these case report case series coming out that we have and it's you know very small percentage of patients who, who are COVID positive who experience seizures but um, you know whether EEG monitoring is indicated in those patients and does it really change their outcome um, that's a topic of debate but you know as a during this time period we are also seeing other patients who have epilepsy or who have acute brain injury due to some other reasons and they either have mild covid or they are pui and they're pending tests and they need eegs acutely um, besides you know in uh, in the last couple of years we've seen that eeg is being used uh, for many, many different reasons beyond just seizure detection like for dci monitoring in subarachnoid hemorrhage patient so our big challenge was how do we provide this care that we normally would in a very safe and effective manner uh, during, during this, uh, this pandemic. So uh, challenges with EEG monitoring, the first foremost was the technologist exposure and their safety because of their risk of, you know, they work with our patients for about 30 to 45 minutes during a full hookup. Um, and, and that's a concern for the nurses as well. But as you know, our technologists uh, have a very unique skill set and they're very limited numbers. And with COVID crisis, we expected that the numbers would even decline further if they have to be quarantined or take care of their family. Um, so with that in mind, um, we, we were facing uh, challenges with, with the technologist. The third part was about disinfection of the machine. So you're taking this big equipment going from patient to patient and how do we ensure safety and prevent this potential spread of the virus and also limit the utilization of PPE, which seems to be scarce at, at most facilities. So, um, you know, these are the sort of resources that have and guidelines that ha are now published at many um, places like, you know, Clinical Neurophysiology Society, ACID, on the Clinical Neurophysiology Society. So we now have some guidelines resources which talk about various different means like um, the, uh, the safety disinfection of the machines using disposable electrodes or even devices that, that you could use to tackle these, to tackle these problems. Um, something similar to this, so our, um, we started having our cases ramp up during um, mid March, and that's when we devised our EEG uh, monitoring guidelines in COVID or PUI patients. And um, similar to other centers, you know, we established that uh, to order an EEG and to obtain an EEG on a COVID or a PUI patient, it has to be ordered by neurology or in discussion with the neurology team, which was not the case before COVID. Um, and then that we would limit the use as much as possible and do em empiric treatment as much as possible with anti-seizure drugs based on the clinical signs, especially those who are PUIs and are waiting tests so that once the test is negative, we can do the hookup. And we actually thought of doing, uh, incorporating uh, the newly developed score to help S2B score, which is a seizure risk stratification score based on the patient's risk factors and the 1R EEG to see if the patient even needs further EEG to continue because that would mean maintenance and you know fixing the electrodes over and over again. And then yes, if the technologists go in, they would follow all the CDC guidelines which were in uh, concordance with our institutional guidelines using the N95 mask. Um, 
But uh, despite, so we implemented these guidelines pretty early on, but we, what we started seeing is that many patients were not just, it wasn't just COVID positive, but many, like almost half the patients were PUIs. And the test at that time took a long time to, you know, the results uh, to come out more than 24 hours. And uh, our limited tech force was going down even further. So we were looking for some other alternative solutions. And that's why we decided to um, use uh, the disposable um, limited montage cerebral devices. And our rationale being that we will minimize the exposure of the text. Um, and since it's quick and fast, it can be incorporated into the nurse's workflow. Um, since it's disposable, you will simplify the cleaning process. And then that because it's done by the nurse, you can reduce the number of people, persons entering the room and save uh, uh, PPEs as well. Um, so this was explored as an alternative in COVID-19 or PUI patients. And uh, this is what our workflow looked like. Um, so, you know, either a neurology team has to be consulted or uh, the teams have to talk to the neurology consult team. And based on the, the clinical history, physical exam, it, you know, and this was mostly done through teleconsults. If an EEG is required, a regular continuous EEG order would be placed. And then they would call the tech that this is COVID positive or PUI patient. And um, once we knew about you know, a request for this and it's approved by neurology, the tech would then take the cerebral device and then um, take it to the patient's nurse and then do just-in-time training with the nurse. The nurse will then go and place the device and then would call the epileptologist and we'd look at the quality of the recording. If it looks good, then you, you know, report the findings uh, in a standard manner. Um, and we also um, had, you know, had envisioned that we could use this at um, night too, with the help of a resident as well. So we have a five hour gap at night when we don't have any tech, but we didn't have to do that except on one occasion. Um, but we, in, in future, we hope to do that because it's, it's a very um, easy training to be done and, and residents at the time of exam, like the other centers are doing, can, can use it. Um, so we, we've had one month of experience so far. So we had nine patients recorded um, with this device and four of them were COVID positive and five were um, patients under investigations which eventually became negative. Um, we actually only obtained eight recordings. So one of the patients was COVID positive uh, but had cardiac arrest as well as he, and was hemodynamically really unstable and had braids on. So uh, we had discussed whether this could be put on arm, but we, because this was a really young patient, we wanted to, for prognostication, we wanted to obtain the recording, but the impedances, uh, we, we couldn't obtain good impedances because of the braids. Um, but regardless, for the eight recordings that we had, we had, you know, the indications, three patients came in with either status or seizures. Three were the ones that persistent encephalopathy who were either COVID positive or that there wasn't any explanation for them being encephalopathic. One was a post cardiac arrest who also had a seizure. And then one patient had a large uh, ischemic stroke with seizure. Um, so with regards to our findings, um, you know, the two patients had uh, lots of faster frequencies on one hemisphere. Uh, Five of them most commonly we saw just generalized slowing. One patient we found had generalized periodic discharges. And one of the patients who had presented with a seizure actually had a seizure during the recording, but at that time the nurse was troubleshooting and the band was completely off. So it's, you know, we missed that because it's just like, you know, when you're doing your impedance checks and then a, then a patient has a seizure during that time. Um, so this is uh, an example of the recording that you would get. So this is a patient who had presented with uh, a left-sided weakness and was altered afterwards. Um, initial CAT scan and the blood glucose was more than 500, was COVID positive. And um, uh, initial CAT CT was negative. CTA did not show any large vessel occlusion. So we suspected that this would be probably be a seizure. So when we hooked her up, we saw that the, the right hemisphere was mostly attenuated, there's loss of faster frequencies. So we thought that this was post-tectal, and this was the patient that had 
seizures, you know, seven, eight hours afterwards that was not um, recorded, but it picks up these focal findings fairly well. Um, again, this is a second patient who presented with status and got quickly intubated and already had a right front encephalomalacia, was on a, a propofol um, infusion. And you can see that you'll see mostly, most of it is a, a pro predominant beta activity, but there is attenuation of faster frequencies on the right side. The patient was being weaned off of the anesthetic and then was extubated the next day. Um, this is a recording from another patient who came in with status and the recording shows mostly it's delta and theta slowing. But what you're seeing over here are these discharges which are about one hertz. The frontally predominant, um, the more, a better form on the left is compared to right and um, we, we categorize them as generalized periodic discharges. Um, so in our experience, we thought the advantages of using this was that it was an easy hookup. Uh, for most of the nurses that I spoke to, it took them less than five minutes. The quality of the recording was good. Uh, the training was simple. Only um, one out of these eight patients required a full montage um, uh, and that was because the patient continued to have some spells um, that we wanted to watch on video because we did not see any epileptiform activity. Um, and then you can record up to 12 hours uh, with, it, with a single device at, during one charge. Um, some limitations that we found was that the recording after five to six hours can sometimes have poor impedance, especially if the nurses are working with the patient and um, they, they had some challenges with troubleshooting, especially overnight, uh, probably because especially early during when we started doing it and the training was still, a, training was failed, so we had not caught up. And, and we already knew about these challenge, you know, limitations, like it doesn't have uh, a video. Um, so if somebody is having spells that you need to watch the video on, that they may need full montage EEG. And then, you, you know, you can't really change the montages to look at the waveform morphology or the distributions very well. But, you know, in our case, for all the patients, our main criteria was, is, is the patient having seizures or not, well, you know, to, to, and to impact the clinical management for, for which we found the device to be um, helpful. So going forward, we think that based on our experience, this was a reasonable alternative to patients who were COVID positive or PUIs and awaiting tests who are at high risk for non-convulsive seizures, particularly patients who came in with status and, and, and got you know, intubated. Um, and then you have no way to know if they are having seizures or not, um, or those patients who had a seizure and acute brain injuries. Um, and most of our challenges uh, were limited to, I think, education and the training of the, the nurses once the device was hooked up in maintaining it. But because it was a phased um, uh, project, I think we are ramping it up even more. And we hope that with more educational efforts and improvement and training that um, this can be a really helpful quick device that can be easily integrated into the nurses' workflow uh, to be used in these patients during this time and, and many more, you know, as we continue to care for these patients. Um, so with that, I would like to thank our entire team. This was a whole team work by our neuro ICU attending, MICU um, attendings and our other um, uh, epilepsy colleagues and our technologists and the nursing staff who took the time to, to you know, learn all about this device and made this.